On April 12, 1961, the Soviet media reported the successful launch, orbit, and re-entry of the first man in space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Celebration erupted worldwide at the cosmonaut's single orbit and the Soviet Union's landmark achievement. Gagarin went on to become one of the greatest heroes in history. With the breakup of the former Soviet Union and the rise of democracy in the Russian Federation, a shocking truth has been unearthed. Access to recently declassified documents in the Kremlin archives by Western journalists, coupled with newly forthcoming eyewitnesses, now confirm that Yuri Gagarin, the symbol and heroic icon of the Soviet Empire, was not the first man in space. This honor belongs to Vladimir Ilyushin. It is now clear that the world-famous Soviet test pilot, Vladimir Ilyushin, was the real first man in space. Numerous accounts of his flight leaked out at the time, and the Kremlin archive documents, along with the eyewitness accounts, only now confirm the accuracy of these original stories. After several decades of propaganda, lies, and official denials, the truth about one of humanity's greatest achievements can now be told. After more than five years of research, the whereabouts of the actual first man in space was learned. Although now in his 70s, retired Air Force General Vladimir Ilyushin still works as one of the designers at the Sukhoi Design Bureau, a Moscow-based fighter jet manufacturer. General Ilyushin was a celebrated test pilot of over 145 aircraft, including the Sukhoi 27, the premier Russian interceptor fighter jet. In piecing together this real-life puzzle of a space mission gone wrong and the subsequent cover-up, the producer spent two full days in Russia with Ilyushin, where he displayed the family museum and offered a glimpse into his amazing life story. Although Ilyushin promised to reveal his story on camera, upon the producer's arrival in Russia, he chose to steadfastly maintain his secrecy. Oddly, he revealed many other facts about his life never before made public that clearly indicated his involvement in the Soviet space program. In order to explain Ilyushin's fear, it is important to understand both the dynamics of the former communist Soviet regime and the top military secrecy in the Soviet space program from its earliest beginnings. In a feat most experts thought impossible, the Soviet Union ushered in the space age on October 4, 1957, when the satellite Sputnik, weighing in at over 100 kilograms, was secretly launched into Earth orbit. Upon the success of Sputnik, people around the world were shocked and dismayed when they realized that the Soviet payload could just as easily have been a nuclear warhead, capable of being delivered anywhere on the planet. After uh, Sputnik was launched, uh, Soviet uh, press published very modest reports of some small objects was delivered to the orbit. Uh, but uh, government clearly was uh, surprised uh, by tremendous uh, outpouring of emotions by international media. And uh, finally they thought, look, this little toy can uh, give in our hands a very important political and propaganda instrument. The success of the Sputnik launch was due entirely to the brilliance and determination of the head of the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev. Korolev was not the genius engineer. He was not a scientist. He was a good engineer. But he was the genius manager. He could manage all these huge people. He will put them together. Without Karolov, it was impossible to do something because all these scientists will uh, be like the ants from one side from the one side to the another. They will now work together. And he created all the put them together like the screen ant. They, they work for him. Nobody knew about Sergei Karolov, and nobody met him. 
that uh, I don't think that uh, I don't think the name in my time there I don't think the name Korolyov was even known. He he was always referred to as the designer. Uh, never by name. And he never appeared at any of the press conferences in my day. The Nobel Prize Committee approached the Soviet leadership for the purpose of awarding the Nobel Prize to the designer of the Sputnik's rocket booster, along with the accompanying accolades and money that emanate from the honor. However, the Soviet government and leader Nikita Khrushchev would not permit the award to go to the individual responsible for the success or allow him to leave the country to accept the award. So it's have no reasonable explanation. It's even difficult not explain to Americans, but to Russians now, why nobody wanted to give the name of Karolyov when the Nobel Committee asked this because they want to give him Nobel Prize. And the Soviets told, no, no, we don't interest in Nobel Prize. He is secret. So it is part of this, of this society, part of this society was just recovering from the Stalin history. It's take, taking a long time. By the late 1950s, it was clear to both the United States and the Soviet Union that the next space challenge would be to send a human into orbit. Several highly trained military jet test pilots were chosen by both nations to literally go where no man had gone before. The Soviet space program remained a highly secretive branch of the military. Test pilots became known as cosmonauts. Космонавты становились известными только после того, как они слетали в космос. До того, космонавты became famous only after they had been in space. Before then, no one was allowed to tell anyone what they did. The rule was made so as not to attract attention to those people who were to become cosmonauts and also to be able to cover up the truth if any accidents occurred. In the 1960s, the Soviets were very secretive about their space program. Pictures would be condensed, things in the background would be changed. For what appears to be no apparent reason, but uh, we can tell that the, the Russians were trying to be secretive, that they were, they were uh, covering up something uh, and not being totally truthful. Uh, we have photographs where, uh, where we believe a cosmonaut in training has been airbrushed away. In October 1960, the most tragic example of the fanatical paranoia of Soviet secrecy occurred. A huge new booster rocket appeared to malfunction at the time of launch. Instead of lifting off, it remained fixed on the launch pad. Ignoring all warnings and flagrantly overriding safety precautions, the Kremlin ordered the launch director and engineers to repair the problem immediately in order to get the rocket launched that same day. Marshal Nedelian, who was the head of rocket uh, strategic forces, personally uh, uh, sitting in the chair next to the rocket was in preparation before the launch. He demanded that uh, this chair should be brought next to the rocket. And uh, it was completely against all the safety regulations. And uh, everyone around knew that this is against uh, the safety regulations, but uh, everyone thought, look, if I wouldn't get uh, uh, placed next to the big uh, boss, uh, I might be f uh, fired ne to ne next day from my job. With more than 200 men inspecting the rocket, including the launch director Nadellin, a huge ball of fire suddenly erupted, instantly killing everyone nearby. No list of the people who died was ever compiled, and no one will ever know just how many people died that day. Amazingly, this historic tragedy was continually denied by the Soviets, and the tragic details of this event 
were not revealed by the Soviet government for almost 30 years. Other recently declassified Kremlin documents also indicate that as many as seven cosmonauts were killed in training accidents prior to Gagarin's reported flight. Cosmonauts Lodovsky, Shiborin, Mitkov, Dolgov, Belokonev, Kachur, and Garachev were never honored for being the pioneers they were, giving their lives in attempts to reach space. They will instead remain as mere names on a secret list of cosmonauts who perished in training accidents. That was the point at which a lot of these guys became increasingly clear that they had been shafted. And uh, they became angry. And there was a lot of anger. But they couldn't do anything. There was no place to go. There was no free press. There were only family members to hear their stories. And after a while, they had told those stories. And what more could they do? Well, of course, everything was built on the Russian propaganda. Естественно, все было засекречено. Говорилось одно, делалось совершенно другое. Everything was built on propaganda and everything was secret. It was always this way and everybody knew about it. The newspapers and radios said one thing and what really happened was something different. What the Soviet propagandists did not understand was that by presenting the difficulties, the problems, the mistakes, the accidents, the mishaps, they could have presented a far better picture of the Soviet Union than in fact they did. That, that to present everything as perfect was in fact to belittle the achievement of the Soviet Union, to belittle the achievement of the Soviet people. And to depict it in that light was to underestimate the heroism, the struggle, the effort of the Soviet people, and you know, show completely a completely inept approach. As a result of the Soviet Union's reported technological achievements, while at the same time hiding its failures, positive perception of communist philosophy was at its peak. Khrushchev reportedly became obsessed with the idea of being the first to successfully launch a man in space and ordered Korolev to make it happen regardless of cost. At that time, Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin was unquestionably the Soviet Union's most famous and experienced test pilot. As a test pilot, Ilyushin set dozens of speed and altitude records and also held the world altitude record of nearly 30 kilometers, which he set in 1959 using a Sukhoi 9 military interceptor jet. In late 1960, Ilyushin was awarded the hero of the Soviet Union, their highest military honor, for his altitude records. Equivalent to the prestigious American Congressional Medal of Honor or a British knighthood, this Soviet award was bestowed upon a select few. Ilyushin himself was the offspring of the most distinguished military and aircraft engineering family in the Soviet Union. His father, Sergei, was one of the most famous heroes in the Soviet Union, designing and building many of the fighter and bomber planes that contributed to saving the Soviets from the invading Nazis at the height of World War II. Sergei Ilyushin, the designer, uh very much involved in World War II fighter planes. And the Soviets, with the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, the IL-2 Sturmovik was probably the most famous of all the Russian aircraft, being a, a ground attack aircraft. So this gave him huge stature under Stalin, and then of course uh, Khrushchev when he took over. In addition, Sergei Ilyushin was also one of the most powerful men in the Soviet Union, having been awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union three times, and being a member of the inner sanctum of Soviet power as a distinguished deputy leader of their parliament, the Supreme Soviet. After World War II, the elder Ilyushin correctly envisioned the future of aircraft manufacturing as requiring the transition from military to civilian production. Once again, 
Ilyushin showed his brilliance in designing and manufacturing some of the best civilian passenger jet airplanes ever made. The Ilyushin Aviation Complex was considered by many to be one of the world's finest civilian airplane manufacturing companies. Ilyushin would, would be respected and, uh, in Soviet society, not because he had three awards, but be why he got the three awards, which, because of his which was because of his work as an aircraft designer and his, his contribution to the develop, post-war development of Soviet civil aviation was outstanding. The younger Ilyushin was always fearful of being lost or stuck in his father's larger-than-life image and set out to free himself from his father's shadow. The younger Ilyushin did not want to be groomed to take over his father's civilian airplane manufacturing company. Instead, he entered test pilot school then went on to design and test pilot military jet fighters. In a final act of defiance, Vladimir joined the Sukhoi Aircraft Company in 1952, his father's most bitter personal rival. The elder Ilyushin is said to have been enraged over his son's actions, remaining highly incensed for several years. Throughout the 1950s, the relationship between elder and younger Ilyushin was non-existent but ultimately culminated in one of mutual pride and respect for each other's accomplishments. Vladimir Ilyushin reportedly snubbed the thought of flying in space when it was first offered to him, regarding it as fit only for dogs and lab rats. The Soviet space capsule was to be operated exclusively by mission control engineers via remote control. No hands-on cosmonaut actions were required, which was an uninteresting prospect for the best test pilot of the era. Still, most of Ilyushin's accomplished fellow test pilots did join the cosmonaut corps in spite of this obvious handicap. At some point shortly after being bestowed the hero of the Soviet Union honor, Ilyushin changed his mind. He began to actively pursue the idea of becoming the first man in space. Ilyushin began to view space as his personal opportunity to separate himself from his larger-than-life father and become an immortal hero on his own and in a field apart from aviation. One of the powerful things that the Aleutians brought to Russia was a sense of a dynasty. There's a group of families who were significant historically, and the Aleutians were certainly one of those. And uh, the fact that it was all in the same sphere in aviation and aerospace sciences was significant. It was therefore, in my view, no accident that Vladimir Lushin would have been picked as the man for the job. I mean, it was an obvious choice. Uh, he was the right age. Uh, he had the right training. He had the name. It would have been perfect had it worked. And that was what first got me interested in the story, was the obviousness that this would have been the logic of the communist regime to pick Lushin for the job. As a result of his professional accolades, coupled with his family's tremendous political influence, Lieutenant Colonel Ilyushin was ultimately given his chance to become the first man in space. Ilyushin doggedly engaged in months of intense catch-up training necessary to prepare him for his chance at immortality, even though his fellow cosmonauts were well into their second year of spaceflight training. Vladimir, who I very well knew, Vladimir, whom I knew well, was very happy, smart, and he was always helpful to others. During his training, he was intense, detail-oriented, and meticulous. All assignments he did to perfection, and the results were the best of any cosmonaut in training. As secretive as a Soviet space program was, there were a number of leaks as to Ilyushin's imminent flight, possibly as a result of his enormous celebrity as the man who had been closest to achieving true spaceflight with his altitude records and the natural choice to be the first man in space. In early 1961, a photograph of Ilyushin wearing space gear was published 
and it was said he was undergoing training as a cosmonaut. My job was to film all aspects of Vladimir's lunch. Vladimir was the nicest, happiest, friendliest pilot I have ever seen. Vladimir was confident and determined, and he was ready for this day. According to declassified documents, Ilyushin was put into the capsule named Rossiya and launched in top military secrecy early in the morning on Friday, April 7, 1961. I was just so excited to be a part of this whole thing. And I was thinking to myself how most people could only read about history. And here I was being a part of history. At the time, the CIA and other military intelligence organizations neither confirmed nor denied the detection of the launch or the flight. Even after several decades, CIA and U.S. State Department documents are still classified on this issue. It is presumed that Western intelligence agencies neither wanted to tip their hand as to their capabilities in detecting Soviet launches and orbits, nor to reveal their sources. Earlier in the year, just a few months before, I had seen a photograph of, of Vladimir Ilushin wearing space gear and referred to as a member of the, uh, the cosmonaut group, training for cosmonauts. Therefore, when I heard the story that Vladimir Ilushin had been up in space, it fitted. Now, I was so sure at that time that the story was true, I tried to get comment from all the Soviet sources I could. From the uh, press department, from Pravda, from Izvestia, from TASS. From all of them, I got the answer, we don't know. We don't know. But subsequently, I realized they did know. During the flight, there was a malfunction in the electrical system, knocking out the guidance controls and radio. Ilyushin lost consciousness during the third orbit just before re-entry, causing ground control to lose contact with the capsule. So I believe what happened was that, uh, that Vladimir Ilyushin was put into orbit. Something went wrong aboard the spacecraft, uh, whether the, the uh, guidance system or, or whatever, and that for several hours, he was subjected to, to uh, conditions that were not conducive to, to his health. Unlike the Americans who had their early capsules land in the ocean, the Soviet capsules had to land on the hard ground within their borders. Because the Soviets had not yet perfected proper re-entry and landing procedures, cosmonauts were expected to eject between 10,000 and 20,000 feet, then parachute to safety. According to recently revealed Kremlin documents, Ilyushin was unable to eject and made a hard landing in the capsule. Amazingly, he survived. Badly hurt, but alive. The dynamics of orbital mechanics are such that the capsule could only have returned to Russian soil near the planned landing site on the first or the 17th orbit. Ilyushin, however, came down on the third orbit. Kremlin archive documents now indicate that Ilyushin went off course and crash landed in mainland China, not the Soviet Union. He was first detained by villagers, then by local authorities, and ultimately was held in China as an honored guest of the country. Regarding the scenario that involved crash landing in China, uh, one of the things that the case of documents which I had a chance to rifle through in the archive 
I did notice quite a few documents referring to Chinese Communist Party officials in this period of time, which was not the best period for Sino-Soviet relations, asking questions about the nature of the space program and direct connection to Aleutians being there. Those questions that were raised by Chinese Communist Party officials about the Soviet space program were directly connected to an incident on their own soil. I think that's certainly, for future researchers and investigators, a definite path to pursue. The worst possible case scenario for the Soviet Union now came true, with their mission in shambles and their hero in the hands of their enemies. The Soviet leadership was in total confusion about what to do. At first, there were many indications that the Soviets were going to publicize the flight. Ultimately, they refused to acknowledge the foreign reports and later, forcefully but sloppily, denied the story altogether with several conflicting and contradictory excuses. By that time, however, it was too late. The story had been broken wide open. Dennis Ogden, the Moscow correspondent with the London-based communist newspaper, The Daily Worker, was among the first to get the Aleutian story published, and he still refuses to reveal his informant to this day. But Ogden did confirm that this source had been a well-placed informant that he trusted fully. The Times had a story very similar to the one I had. I'm not surprised that uh, uh, Hungarians and Yugoslavs and other correspondents uh, published such stories or knew of such stories. All correspondents knew of such stories. And uh, we were constantly exchanging phone calls. Have you heard this? Have you heard that? And what do you think of it? Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. There was one of a French reporter that was there on that day, one from Bulgaria. Uh, various uh, American Air Force people made comments that an attempt was made. And those sources were independent. You know, they wasn't, it wasn't a case of one source and then another by picking it up. They were separate sources. For several decades, the Soviets angrily and profusely denied these stories as fabrications and lies, and had propaganda writers discredit, slander, and defame the reputations of these reporters and correspondents. It was only after the collapse of communism and the breakup of the former Soviet Union that access to Kremlin archive documents and memos confirmed the truthfulness and accuracy of these stories about Vladimir Ilyushin. I first heard about the Ilyushin story from Russian colleagues who basically whispered it. I got a clear sense that there was something about this story which I hadn't heard about in the West that needed to be pursued, but it took, uh, I guess from the first time I heard about it to the time when I was able to get access to some documents, it took about eight years. In a society that was built around secrets, the archives are, you know, the most important resource to be protected, not necessarily to preserve the memory, but to preserve the fictions. So that's one of the reasons why getting access to archival material is still difficult to this day. With the advent of Russian democracy and the availability of substantiating documentation, Ilyushin's story can now be appreciated in full. Finally, I was able to finagle my way into a library uh, which gave me an opportunity to read some things that I wouldn't have been able to get access to otherwise, and that helped me conclude some of the things that I wrote in the story. There were really three types of documents. There was the pre-launch documentation, there was the catastrophe, and there were documents pertaining to uh, discussions that took place after the event. Back in April 1961, the Soviet media was becoming more and more vociferous, contradictory, and utterly confusing in denying that Ilyushin was, in fact, the first man in space. At first, 
The story released by the Soviets proclaimed that Ilyushin was never a part of the cosmonaut corps and that he was in excellent health. Then they admitted that Ilyushin was a cosmonaut in training, but was in a car accident the month before and couldn't be the first man in space. Then they reported that Ilyushin was not a cosmonaut in training because he had been in a car accident back in 1959, which was later modified and changed by the Soviet media to mid-1960, and that Ilyushin was in a coma from the time of the accident until March of 1961. Numerous contradictions of this nature added to the skepticism of Western journalists at that time, not the least of which was a photo taken of a healthy Ilyushin in December of 1960, just four months before his spaceflight. The photo showed Ilyushin receiving the Hero of the Soviet Union Award for his altitude record. Obviously, he was not in a coma at that time. The Soviet government never could produce Ilyushin himself during this time to refute the alleged flight but always maintained its insistence through the media that Ilyushin was not the first man in space. The, the confused stories about Ilyushin simply demonstrate the point that I've made several times that the Soviet Union was its own worst enemy. The talk of Soviet propaganda being efficient, effective, is just nonsense. I don't believe, I never believe, that the story of the Soviet, Soviet Union was good at propaganda. It was not. To explain how Ilyushin could be in mainland China at that time, the communist-controlled government media in the Soviet Union reported that Ilyushin was sent to a rehabilitation hospital in China. There were also contradictions and falsehoods given by the Soviets regarding even this story. There were two reports uh, on Vladimir Ilyushin being injured and being sent to China. One of them had him in a Peking hospital, one of them had him in a Hangzhou hospital. Uh, it's very doubtful to me that somebody in a car accident in a Soviet Union, especially the son of a famous aviation designer and somebody himself, a test pilot, a military test pilot, would be sent to a Chinese hospital for uh, recuperation. I never heard of anybody being sent from the Soviet Union to China for medical treatment. And the medical facilities available in the Soviet Union, perfectly uh, satisfactory, probably better than those available in China. And the second point was that, of course, in from during the sec during, uh, towards the end of the 50s and in the early 60s, Soviet-Chinese relations were very strained. And I really couldn't conceive that uh, someone like Ilyushin uh, would, would be sent there. I find it difficult to understand. Obviously, the Soviets were caught in a no-win situation. Khrushchev could not simply cover up this failure with sheer propaganda. So when Khrushchev came to power, he made our society much less closed. But before, everything was secret. Now, still many things remain secret, which has no explanation. Because, for example, he, they told why we have to told to all the world about our failures. It will not help us. All the failures were known only to a narrow circle, and uh, you know there was a kind of uh, oral history. You know, you could learn from friends what happened at the launch. But uh, uh, it was amazing that now, in retrospect, we did not have more failures. I think the way uh, government tried to hide the failures was really detrimental for the program. People wonder why did they not disclose catastrophes? Well, I mean, the easy answer, of course, is that it was embarrassing. Marxist-Leninist economics and Marxist-Leninist politics prided itself on being a scientific, objective analysis of human and natural law. And if you are really good at your 
Marxist-Leninist theory, then nothing in the real world should be less than perfect. So it was a great embarrassment not only to disclose this fact externally, but to have to admit it internally in the halls of power. I think they were put in a situation then that, that uh, they didn't have somebody they could present to the public. And here, Khrushchev had been using the space program as, as one of his big uh, propaganda hammers. And to have this kind of, of, of failure, it was intolerable. In an almost unbelievable coincidence, on Saturday, April 8th, 1961, the day after Ilyushin's ill-fated mission, an internal meeting was quickly scheduled by Korolyov for various members of the military and government for the purpose of introducing the next first man in space, Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin. This meeting, however, was not acknowledged until after Gagarin's flight, and the film documentation was not released for several years after the flight. It's difficult to single out any out of six splendidly trained cosmonauts, but it must be done. The Air Force Command recommends Senior Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin for the first flight in space with German Titov as the backup. In hindsight, it is very difficult to even imagine that the cosmonaut chosen to be the very first man in space would be named so hastily and on a Saturday with only three or four days of preparation before the most historic launch in human history was to take place. By comparison to the heroic record-setting test pilot Ilyushin, Gagarin was not even in the same league. He had just recently graduated from flight school and was considered a novice pilot without a single noteworthy achievement to his credit. Gagarin was, however, young, articulate, attractive, and a committed member of the Communist Party. Allow me to assure the Soviet government, the Communist Party and people that I will carry out with honor the task entrusted to me and that I will be able to overcome all difficulties I may encounter the way a good communist should. Five days after the Ilyushin flight, the successful Gagarin mission was reported in the Soviet media. It is noteworthy to point out that Khrushchev was in Moscow at the time of Ilyushin's flight but was on vacation to a remote resort on the Black Sea at the time of Gagarin's launch. Khrushchev was caught totally by surprise when told about Gagarin's flight by phone, and he immediately returned to Moscow, then arranged a tremendous hero celebration with Gagarin. Some Soviet experts now believe that Khrushchev was so overwrought with Ilyushin's failure that he had to go on vacation, and that Korolyov took things into his own hands to launch Gagarin no matter what the consequences without even bothering to tell Khrushchev in the event there might have been another failure. Yuri Gagarin was clearly a political piece uh, that Khrushchev and the Soviet Union used to the maximum extent they could. Uh, after the flight, he was welcomed back in Moscow. Uh, he went on a tour of the world. He went to London and India. And he was a spokesman of the Soviet Union. He was the typical, being portrayed as the typical Soviet uh, uh, person, you know, uh, young, aggressive, uh, bright, courageous, you know, everything that they wanted to portray communism to be. An interesting note in a recently declassified State Department document reveals that the leaders of almost every country sent Khrushchev gifts and congratulatory letters over Gagarin's successful flight, with China being the sole exception, choosing to remain mysteriously quiet during the entire affair. However, China did send congratulatory letters to the Soviet leadership on all subsequent Soviet space missions. Perhaps this was the subtle way China could tell the world that they knew Gagarin was not the first man in space. With the successful flight of Gagarin, 
the Ilyushin flight became a non-event. As for those who knew the truth about Ilyushin, such as reporter Dennis Ogden, his informant, and the space program engineers and technicians involved in the flight, each was forced to participate in a conspiracy of silence driven by fear. I got a call, a call from my superior. He told me in no uncertain terms to destroy everything uh, I had on Vladimir and to just keep quiet about the whole affair. From the tone of his voice, I knew clearly that if I didn't do exactly as he said, my family and I would have one-way tickets and a permanent address change to Siberia. I was summoned to the press department to meet the head of the press department, a man called Harlamov. He had been instructed by the Central Committee to conduct an investigation into my story. He said, leaning across the table, I only want to know one thing. Who told you? I said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Why not? Journalistic ethics. And then he blew up in a big way and he said, yes, but uh, we, we want to know who told you because this person has done great harm. Had I been what was called in Moscow a bourgeois correspondent, a non-communist correspondent, I'm sure I would have been expelled. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but it would have been very embarrassing for them to expel a communist correspondent. Through all the years of propaganda and denials, the story of Vladimir Ilyushin and his space flight had been relegated to the garbage can of hoaxes, myths, and fabrications generated by overzealous and imaginative Western reporters. Ogden himself was branded as a fantasy writer and flat-out liar. The Soviets, however, went to extraordinary measures to find out who Ogden's informant was. Ogden was constantly followed by the KGB in hopes of capturing his informant. Both Ogden and his informant feared for their very lives. I went to a reception, and as I, and I sensed that one of my minders was close behind, uh, and as I walked through the door, straight ahead of me was my informant. And I knew that if my minder saw him and me together, that was it. He would know. And I, uh, fortunately, fortunately, my informant saw my minder and realized the situation and just ignored me. Since both China and the Soviet Union were hostile to the West, no press reports were ever made available on Ilyushin's stay in China, nor on any swap for his release. While it is still unclear as to what kind of deal was struck between the Soviet Union and China to get Ilyushin back, in either an exchange of spies or money or both, Ilyushin finally and quietly came home about a year after his flight, and shortly thereafter resumed working in his home for the Sukhoi Aircraft Company in a very low-key manner. Vladimir Ilyushin was in a position uh, that I believe was uh, problematic for Khrushchev and the government. First off, he was a vain, very famous person in his own right. As a test pilot, uh, he was famous because of the family that he was born into and the, and the what would you consider to be the elite within the Soviet Union. So I think the, what uh, came down was, uh, it was a joint decision that, that Vladimir would just basically just be quiet. The brilliant Soviet space designer, Sergei Korolyov, also suffered once again from the hysteria and secrecy surrounding the Soviet space program. He was again denied his due, just like Ilyushin was. <laughs> 
Sergei Korolev was the chief designer of the uh, rocket and spacecraft used for the Gagarin flight, the first manned flights. Uh, the Nobel uh, Committee wanted to give this person a Nobel Prize for the accomplishment. It was a tremendous accomplishment. But under Khrushchev and the tight regime at the time, uh, even those that followed Khrushchev, uh, there was no release of his name uh, at all until, until, in fact, his death in 1966. It is indeed hard to believe that Korolev went to his grave in 1966, having been cheated out of not just one, but two Nobel Prizes for his brilliance. Because Korolev lived in a society where paranoia and cover-ups were the norm, the world never knew or appreciated his unparalleled contribution to space exploration during his lifetime. Looking back at the stories of the personalities, the Khrushchev personality, the Korolev personality, the Gagarin personality, the Aleutian personality, uh, Probably the most interesting element of it was the Shakespearean character of the, the, the life that was led after these events by Gagarin and Aleutian. Of course, if Gagarin was not the first in space, he was probably aware of that fact at some point, and that may have led to his demise, alcoholism and lack of control in public. Apparently, he became uh, very difficult for the Communist Party to cope with because he would say things in public that were an embarrassment, if not outright uh, dangerous. There were even reports of Gagarin throwing a glass of champagne in the face of Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev at a government function. Shortly thereafter, in March 1968, Gagarin died in a highly suspicious and mysterious MiG jet crash. In perhaps the ultimate twist of fate, Vladimir Ilyushin was appointed to lead the committee investigating the crash, whose report was inconclusive and left many nagging questions. Ilyushin himself reported that Gagarin's body was never found, and only a finger of the once great hero was recovered from the wreckage, leading many experts to question whether or not Gagarin may well have been murdered by the KGB at Brezhnev's instructions. Meanwhile, the true conquering hero must continue to live, wrestling with the memory of the life that was due him. The life that was led by Aleutian uh, was actually quite significant. I mean, he did not only work as a test pilot after the fact, but he also uh, became a significant designer. And I think it's kind of tragic that the one man who the world acknowledges still today as the great hero actually may have been a fabrication. And that's kind of a sad end to the story, that the two guys went different ways, and each, in one sense, got the reverse of what you would have expected. The hero wound up being the tragic figure, and the one that they tried to bury turned out to actually make a lasting contribution. Even though this gentle giant of a man must face the statues of Gagarin, visit the buildings that bear Gagarin's name, and participate in the ceremonies that hail Gagarin as the first man in space. Vladimir Ilyushin knows in his heart that it was his accomplishment that broke new ground, not only in the space race of the Cold War, but in the human quest for knowledge, adventure, and conquest. I moved to America several years ago, and I am so happy that the Soviet Union and that the communism are finished. And now I don't have to keep quiet to protect the Soviet Union's good name. So if the KGB wants to come after me now, then I'll be waiting for them to spit in their faces after what they did to Vladimir. With the truth at last unveiled, Vladimir Ilyushin deserves to be recognized as the space pioneer and hero he is, rather than as a footnote in a falsified history. <laughs>